John, thank you so much. It is a real pleasure to be here to celebrate. It's been 10 years? Boy, that's a, that, that's a, a remarkable thought since we were all gathered by the Gairdner Foundation to celebrate this rough draft of the human genome sequence. It was a, it was a really fun celebration, and I think the Gairdner did a really classy thing by inviting such a large number of, uh, and honoring such a large number of people as part of that uh, remarkable celebration. So I want to thank the Gairdner Foundation, and I take it as, as now the assignment for having uh, come then to now have to come back and account for ourselves as to what exactly came over this course of the, of the past decade from this, uh, you know, this draft sequence of the human genome. So that's my job. This morning, I'm going to try to sketch what we've learned and what lies ahead. Now, I know this is a diverse audience. We have uh, ministerial staff here. We have, uh, on the other hand, genomic experts I recognize in the audience. We have people from biomedicine. We have people from other parts of the life science. Forestry, I met one. We have entirely non-life scientists here. So I have no idea exactly how I'm going to manage to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to give you a scientific tour of what we've learned in this last decade, what's changed in this last decade, and I'm going to attempt to do it without using too much jargon. My slides may have details, but I'm not going to fuss over those details and make it at least useful for the aficionado a little bit and mostly accessible to, to all of you. And then we'll have questions afterwards. We'll see how close I can possibly come to serving such a diverse audience on this occasion. So the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project was really an unusual step in biology. It was the recognition by our community that in order to really drive biomedical progress, we needed to have a set of powerful tools and make them available to everybody. Now, there's a lot of creativity in recognizing that we had to make these tools and what these tools were and how to make these tools. But in another sense, at the end of the day, they became infrastructure for what was even more exciting, thousands and thousands of labs around the world using it. So this Human Genome Project like had a plan, uh, quite remarkably, a plan emerged in the late 1980s that we would try to build a scaffold of genetic markers, variable D DNA sequence variations up and down the chromosome whose inheritance could be used to, to trace the inheritance of diseases in families, a so-called genetic map. Then a physical map of the underlying DNA, so if you knew that a particular disease gene segregated in a particular area of the genome, you would then be able to have access to the DNA in the region. And then the sequence map, so that you would be able to just double click on your computer and up would pop the sequence for that region. And that it would be annotated with all the genes so that you would know what was there. And so the things you referred to cystic fibrosis, minister referred to cystic fibrosis, well cystic fibrosis is a triumph. It also took seven years of, of slogging work to get there, many, many tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of people, hundred people working on it, to get to the point where cystic fibrosis would be a chip shot, where it'd be the sort of thing that would be a good rotation project for a student in your laboratory during the first couple of months. That was the real goal of this Human Genome Project. And to make that happen, we needed all of this information, we needed to know how to use it, and we needed to have it be freely available. So anyway, the Human Genome Project got completed. Indeed, it got completed many times. We had many celebrations for the completion of the Human Genome Project. No one liked the party more than the Human Genome Project. We celebrated it at the White House in 10 Downing Street in June of 2000 before any paper was even written. Um, you know, those of us who still like these scientific niceties of publishing papers considered more like the February 15, 2001 publication of a real paper on the draft sequence to be the relevant event. But it was still only a draft sequence. It was only 90 percent of the sequence. Still had a quarter of a million gaps and errors and things. And so the International Consortium pressed on with development of new techniques to the point where we had a finished sequence that we could announce and celebrate with more parties in April of 2003 chosen to be the 50th anniversary of the Watson Crick paper, and the actual paper itself came out about a year later. So a lot of parties, and I always feel compelled to note that the finished sequence of the human genome is, of course, not finished. Um, finished is a technical term. It meant all of the DNA that could be cloned by existing technologies had been cloned and had been sequenced, 
and it covers about 99.3% of the euchromatic sequence of the genome, but there's still about 300 gaps that are still there, centromeres, telomeres, that we just can't accurately read through. It doesn't matter to the vast majority of biomedical research, but I always feel obliged to say so, that there's still more to go. All right, well, that's where we were last time we met with the Gardner Foundation. Over the 10 years since the draft sequence, what's happened? Well, I think there was some hope on the part of some that uh, we could get back to business as usual and be done with these kind of projects and maps and catalogs. But in fact, the reverse happened. It became clear that the power of comprehensive information was so great that we needed more of them that having had genetic maps and physical maps and sequence maps, we now needed to take that sequence and really work out deep gene maps, where all the genes were, evolutionary conservation maps, every portion of the genome that evolution had lovingly preserved versus other ports, parts that had been allowed to drift, chromatin state maps, the different types of modifications sitting on top of the genome, the epigenomic modifications, and where they lived in different tissues and have all that there, the 3D folding maps, which parts of the genome were physically in space near which other parts. We needed to know with respect to disease, maps of all the inherited genetic variation in the population. This human genome sequence that we celebrated was one sequence. We needed to know all the genetic variation of the population. We needed to know how that genetic variation was associated with disease. We needed to map the events of evolutionary selection that had swept across that genome over the course of tens of thousands of years in many different populations. We needed to have the maps of all the modifications that occur in cancer cancer genome maps. So one theme that has emerged and stuck with biology is the power of maps. And just like with Google Maps on your computer where you can layer more and more layers on top of it and have the basic roads but also know where the pizzerias are on top of that and it's all integrated, we need to have maps and those maps have to get better and better. In addition, catalogs were very powerful. Knowing a few genes is one thing, but when you know all the genes, then you can build detectors like microarrays that have little representatives of every gene because if something hybridizes to this detector and you know the whole genome, you know there's nothing else but that. It means you can do proteomics. You can break up a protein and if you see a little fragment of amino acids go by and it's got this sequence, you can look up in the genome and say it can be nothing but this particular protein. That was actin that just went by. So completeness gave us the ability to use signatures in the laboratory, signatures of nucleic acids, signatures of proteins, maps and catalogs were themes. Another thing that happened since the, the uh, time we were all here celebrating with the Gardners is that the technology that we used to be so proud of about DNA sequencing, you know, we could sequence a billion bases in our laboratory, has gotten stunningly better. This here is the cost curve for sequencing since around then. Uh, more, this is a log plot, by the way, going down by factors of 10. Moore's law that they like to brag about in the semiconductor industry is shown in that black line there. What's happened to sequencing is shown in the red line there. It has gone down dramatically faster than Moore's law, such that over the course of 10, 11, 12 years, something like that, we've achieved about a one million-fold reduction in sequencing costs. I venture to say I can't think of a lot of areas where million-fold improvements uh, in cost have been achieved in about a decade. You know, think about what that means for house prices, if houses were a million times cheaper or something like that, or air travel. Um, it's kind of stunning. And so that has completely blown the roof off what you can do. It becomes possible to think about sequencing thousands of people, tens of thousands of cancers, all the mammalian species on the planet, all the microbes in your gut. And biology is truly becoming an information science. So sequencing is becoming a very powerful tool for discovery and will remain. It, anything that you can read out with sequence, you should read out with sequence because it's cheap. It's cheaper than many other experiments. And so if you can turn your experiment to, to a sequencing experiment by some hook or crook, you should. It means we can read out variation in species and populations. And it means it will increasingly be a tool in medicine. Now, I'm not Pollyanna about this, that it solves all of medicine, but as it becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, it should become a routine tool for the things that it can be powerful for, including pre-symptomatic, prenatal, premarital pre counseling with regard to genetic diseases, um, cancer, immune repertoires, microbiomes, 
We're still not there. The cost of sequencing a whole genome really, truly, honestly is four or $5,000. They say in the newspapers it's a $1,000 genome. It's actually not, but it's all right. A $5,000 genome will get to a $1,000 genome, and people already see how it might get into the hundreds of dollars. And at some point, the cost of drawing blood becomes more, ex more expensive than the cost of sequencing the genome, and we don't worry about the cost so much anymore. We're getting into that range now where it will become ubiquitous information. So I want to ask, what have we learned intellectually from all this? Well, it's only been a decade, and all of these developments, have, you know, fast sequencing have really only kicked in in the past several years, but what have we learned from all this? Well, I've told you what we've learned for, about genome sequencing, how to do it a lot faster and cheaper, but what have we learned about the functional elements encoded in the human genome, about the evolution of the genome, about the basis of inherited disease, the basis of cancer? What have we learned about human history? I just want to sketch those topics briefly this morning in a way that I hope will be accessible and yet still of interest for the aficionados. Let's start with understanding the genome. So understanding the genome, you have to know where were we in 2001 when we were finishing up the human genome and what have we learned since. Here are the things we confidently knew in 2001. We confidently knew that the human gene count was between 35,000 and 120,000, but there was a lot of controversy as to exactly where in that range it was. We confidently knew that there was important regulatory sequence information that sat in front of a gene and controlled it, its promoter and some enhancers, but that was small relative to the amount of information devoted to coding the protein for the gene. We knew there were a couple of weird examples, about a dozen examples, of strange non-coding RNAs. Um, you know, there were ribosomal RNAs and transfer RNAs and snow RNAs and some weird things, you know, exist in telomerase, and they were exceptions. And we also knew that half the genome was consisted of junk DNA, parasites, transposons. So these things we know. What have we learned since then? Well, what does progress look like? Progress looks like the fact that we have now learned that all of those things were wrong. Um, that's real progress. So what do I mean all of those things were wrong? Well, evolutionary conservation has been an amazingly powerful tool for studying the human genome. As soon as we had the sequence of the human, we wanted the sequence of something to compare it to, and that was the mouse. As soon as we had the mouse genome and we lined up the human and the mouse sequences and compared them, we realized we were learning a lot and we wanted to have more, and that was the rat and the dog. And as soon as we had those and we realized how much we were learning, we realized we needed lots of mammals, and so we got lots and lots of mammals and other vertebrate genomes, and there's more than 50 mammalian genomes, 50 vertebrate genomes that have been sequenced, and it's growing and growing. By lining these up, one can see what evolution has conserved. It turns out that that gene count that people had said in the 90s, it was 100,000 genes. I teach freshman biology at MIT, and I told a generation of students there were 100,000 genes in the genome, but it ain't true. In the sequence of the human genome paper, we wrote 30 to 40,000 genes was our best guess. The truth was we could kind of only see about 30,000, but we were very uncomfortable about it being so low, so we wrote 30 to 40,000 to cover ourselves on the upper end. It turned out we erred in the wrong direction because as the data got better, it was clear it was less than 30,000 protein coding genes. We revised it downward to about 25,000 in the mouse paper, and then finally as we had finished human genome sequence and the mouse and the rat and the dog, it's clear that there's somewhere between 21 and 22,000 protein coding genes in the human genome, and you can see it by evolutionary conservation. That what we were calling genes were a lot of gene fragments scattered about. And in fact, those gene fragments don't encode genes. They were the detritus of uh, various different uh, transposed genes and things. So anyway, there's a lot fewer protein coding genes than we ever thought. But if there's a lot fewer protein coding genes, there was a lot more regulatory information scattered around the genome. While the genome only had conserved 1.2% of its sequence in protein coding genes, the genome had evolutionarily conserved 6% of its total sequence. So evolution lovingly preserved 6% of the total sequence, and only 1.2% of that was protein coding. That meant the vast majority of what evolution had bothered to conserve at the sequence level was not protein coding. It was something else, regulatory or encoding RNAs or whatever. Now, at the beginning, when we first found this with four mammals, 
we could only pin down specifically about 1.6 percentage points of that stuff because it was a little bit of mathematical inference as to how much was there. But most recently in the past year with 29 mammalian sequences, we can put our finger on 3 million such elements. Largely, they look like regulatory elements across the genome, accounting for 4.7 percentage points of this stuff. So the vast majority of those things are no longer just inferred but have been identified and meaning is being attached to those sequences. What kind of meaning do they have? Well, if you take the most highly conserved sequences amongst those non-coding elements and just ask, where do they live in the human genome? It turns out they live in funny places. The most highly conserved non-coding sequence of the human genome resides in regions that are pretty poor in genes. They're gene-poor regions. Not no genes, just gene-poor regions. And if you ask, what genes live in the regions that have the most of this regulatory stuff? It turns out early developmental control genes live in these weird regions. And they look something like this, a little red gene down there, which is the protein coding port portion, and a tremendous amount of purple regulatory information sitting around that early developmental control gene, which tells you that's what it takes to correctly regulate in early development one simple transcription factor. And you might think, that what differs between mammals is not that red protein coding gene, but it's tweaking of the regulation. And it's all of the, it's exploration of those purple regulatory sequences, and the evidence is now clear that that's right. Because when we, when we as a community got sequence of the marsupial genome, we were able to figure out how much of the genome's conserved stuff, how much of what was conserved amongst placental mammals had been invented since our divergence from marsupials. And to make a long story short, the vast majority of evolutionarily new stuff that arose in the 90 million years since we diverged from marsupials, but before the mammalian radiation, was in fact regulatory stuff. That is the stuff of evolution, at least, that seems to distinguish between mammals. Or another way is we've been rather derivative with respect to our proteins, not a lot of new protein invention. Most invention is how you turn the dials.